if you are walking the talk or at least making the attempt to walk the talk, it unlocks a very different magnetic field in and around your team. We can have plans, we can have strategies, frameworks around it, but the intention is very important. Welcome to Wise on Air, the podcast where we talk to the world's leading thinkers and doers in education. My name is Basim and I'm the producer of the show. Wise is the global education initiative of the Qatar Foundation. Last time on Wise on Air, we were joined by three 2022 Wise Awards winning project holders, Jan V. Canoria, Susan Matana, and Tyler Samstag. We brought these innovators on the show because we're looking to decipher what does it take to unlock the potential of great ideas to transform education. In a rapidly evolving world, it can be argued that traditional education models are being constantly disrupted with the advent of new technological breakthroughs. Speaking of tech, you might have had a few examples come to mind while listening to this. In 2023 alone, we're certainly seeing massive strides with AI and machine learning, for example. In fact, according to a report by Holland IQ, the global education market is estimated to reach $10 trillion by 2030, with a growing number of startups and investors seeking to revolutionize the sector. As we navigate these changes, it's important to understand what sets successful education initiatives apart. What can we learn from the ones that have made a real impact? In this episode, we'll dive into some of the groundbreaking solutions that are reshaping education in different contexts around the world. Following our conversation last time with Janvi, Susan and Tyler, joining us are the other three WISE Awards winning innovators, Daniela Labra of Mexico-based project Educating for Wellbeing by the organization Atentamente, Andrew McCusker of Chicago-based project Opportunity Edufinance by Opportunity International, and Kuldeep Dantewadia of India-based project Climate Change Problem Solvers by Reap Benefit. You'll be hearing more about how these projects operate during this conversation, and you can also check out the links in the description to learn more about them. But without further ado, let's jump into this conversation and really try to learn what it takes to innovate in the education space. <music> I'm joined today by my fellow WISE colleague, Neve. Hello, my name is Neve Whelan. I'm part of the Innovation for Quality and Access track at WISE, which in includes the WISE Awards. Thank you, Neve. And of course, our esteemed guests, Andrew, Kuldeep and Daniela. We can start off this conversation just getting to know each other a little more and letting the listeners g gain a couple of insights on who you are and what drew you to education in the first place. Yeah, maybe we can start with you, Andrew. What drew you to education? What inspired you and ultimately your project that you're involved with? Yeah, sure. It was actually by chance in a way. In the, my first trip through Sub-Saharan Africa, I spent my time camping. And I don't know if you've been to Sub-Saharan Africa before, but it takes a really long time to travel anywhere by land. And so what that meant is that I was staying in really small villages in most nights. And it was the same story in many places across many countries that you would show up, like walk past a school at 10 a.m. on Tuesday, and there would be hundreds or thousands of kids that would show up to school excited. Like I grew up in Australia and you, my parents like couldn't drag me to school, right? And like just the lack of opportunity, there was kids running around the classroom when they could have been learning. And I was like, I had this great corporate experience up until that time and just wanted to find some innovative projects that could work at scale. And so I got my first job in Kenya. I'm working for a fellow WISE awardee actually from 2015 called Bridge International Academies in corporate finance. Spent some time with them in Kenya and then London and then joined Opportunity International about five and a half years ago working for the Education Finance Program. Amazing. Thank you, Andrew. So here we jump to Daniela now. So for me, I think it was a lifelong love for education. Really thinking like Mandela says that it's the, it's the best weapon to change the world. And then there was something lacking in education. I studied biology. I cared about consciousness and about the mind. And I never saw any of that in education or anything in my education that taught me how to deal with my own mind and with my own awareness and how to better relate to others. Those two things came together. And knowing that we were not really being taught these kind of very vital life skills that were so important. Then going through education and really trying to share with more people the capacity to be 
better and work with these skills and develop these skills in education. That's when we went into social emotional learning and really trying to work and bring well-being as an academic goal. And maybe you can tell the audience a little about the project as well. Sure. Atentamente is a non-for-profit we have in Mexico. And what we have done is work mainly in education settings. So we've reached up to now like half a million teachers through the programs in inserting social emotional learning in the national curricula and then through our own programs and reached maybe around five million students. But particularly our, la- our emphasis and why we got this award is for a program we call Educating for Wellbeing and it's particular version directed to pre-K education. We've been working around 13 states in Mexico, reaching around 13,000 teachers, 300,000 students with this program. So we focus on adult capacity buildings and not just teachers. We believe in a systemic approach that addresses the skills of principals, teachers. So it will become protective environment where relationships are supportive, where actually are also consistent for children and where teachers, principals and everybody around can actually model the skills we want the children to learn. I want to jump to you, Kuldino. What drew you to education, ultimately the project that you're involved with? Yeah, yeah. So I think in a way, when I look back, it feels like uh, I was being prepared to do this. Uh, Two big forces were, one was my own school. And it was a very interesting way of schooling wherein Whenever we went and spoke about a problem, you know, uh, a water tap is leaking or there's garbage on the road or there is some other issue, we were almost told that to solve it by yourself, like you you solve it. So there was this whole culture built of, oh, if you see a problem, you own it and you try to solve it rather than pontificate or intellectualize. And slowly it became a way of life. It, it never felt this was something different or this was something unique. And the second big influence was the city of Bangalore. I'm, I'm born in Bangalore in India. Very early on in my life, my, my father uh, moved from a small town to Bangalore. And I think his only dream in life was to live in Bangalore. So as a young kid uh, growing up, uh, he would say, you know, this is such a beautiful city. This is such a great city. So everything about that city became mine. In a way, I felt like the mayor of the city, you know, not even elected, but became the mayor of the city. And um, I felt, uh, you know, it's my responsibility to own the city. So it just became a way of life. It was it was not something which was separate or different and things like that. From school, when I moved to college, um, I felt very restless because in college, anytime we would see a problem, people would intellectualize it. You know, the government should do this. This policy change should happen. But my training was, yeah, well, that is equally important. What are we doing about it? These small, small micro actions um, or I was collecting these small, small dots all my life. And I think suddenly it connected together. Yeah, that's uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing at this point. No, really interesting stuff. And, and you experienced that step by step throughout your life. But do you feel like there was a eureka moment that led you to ultimately what the project you're involved with is today? Do you feel like there was a day where you just realized, okay, here's the solution. And how did you come up with it? I don't know if I still have the solution, Uh, 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 but um, I think uh, what our work does is uh, it at least helps us uh, clarify and help us get towards the solution. But I think the Eureka moment for me was uh, after college, I was 21 then, I just decided to start collecting garbage or trash from 150 households in Bangalore. So I was a garbage collector for 10 months. And while I was collecting garbage from these households, I realized that If we have to solve complex environment and social problems, we have to get citizens and communities involved. Uh, It cannot be done by governments alone or big companies alone. In a way, I kind of committed myself to this mission. How do we get citizens involved? But in citizens also, it's such a big term. The idea was how do we get young people involved and build this muscle? Because it's a muscle. Solving something is a muscle. I could say that was my eureka moment for doing what I'm doing at this point. Uh, But if if the question is like, is there one silver bullet wherein we can magically change all the young people to solve issues? I'm not yet there. Yeah, I mean, I could could imagine that. (laughs) Maybe we can jump back to you, Daniela. Was there a eureka moment uh, when it comes to Atentamente? There was a, a moment where His Holiness Dalai Lama visited Mexico. I was helping organize that visit. And at that time, he went to the, to teach to the teacher's union. And he said something that he's usually saying, and he's, he's always advocating for secular ethics and education. And he said, you know, cognitive isn't enough. You have to teach 
emotion and compassion. And this is now you're great at the cognitive aspect. You just have to do this and I'll be back in a year to see that you've done it. And we're like, okay. <laughs> and I was there and the teachers from the teachers union came to see us and said, we want to do what His Holiness said. And that was the eureka moment for me in that it put together many things, like all the aspect of my life that I, as I briefly mentioned, which came from contemplative training and understanding the mind from first person perspective in a like pretty scientific way that comes from, in my case, from the Buddhist practice. And then education and the science that was already out there in terms of something that Paul Ekman and Alan Wallace put together in a randomized controlled trial, teaching teachers contemplative practices, and then from other people, Susan Kaiser Greenland particularly, who had been working or translating this work for children. So how do you actually train attention and empathy, and emotional intelligence and working with your thoughts? So I started like, oh, yes, we can do it. Now we can train teachers, we can train children, we can put this together. And this needs to be completely secular. I've always believed in secular education. It's a very big thing in Mexico. As Catholic as we are, it's a very important thing for us to have. But I thought this is what we need. We need to bring knowledge that's from the world to help the world. It doesn't really matter where it's coming from, as long as it is constructed in a way that's useful and helpful. So that was this moment when I said, we can do it. We can just bring it all together. A salient point and uh, eloquently said, if I could say so myself. Uh, we could jump to Andrew's Eureka moment now. Yes, yeah, so there was no Eureka moment for me in that the education finance program was really designed um, by parents who were looking for finance to send their kids to school and by school entrepreneurs and so people that owned and operated a school in their own community who were looking for funding to grow their schools. Um, at the time, Opportunity International, the organization with which I work, um, had a microfinance institution in Ghana that was lending to other small businesses and to parents um, or to people for, for consumer businesses. And at the time, they had schools that started knocking on the door looking for funding to grow their schools. And so Opportunity at the time lent to those school leaders with a traditional small business loan. Um, and what they quickly discovered is that the product needed to innovate to meet the needs of schools in that the schools have very different cash flow cycles to many other businesses in that they charge fees at the start of term and then pay those fees away in teacher salaries and other costs. If you're a financial institution and try to collect from a school owner at the end of term, there's a chance that you won't get that repayment. And so they structured the loan a little bit differently. Fast forward 15 years from that to now, um, and it's now in 30 countries around the world from these ideas that came from central Ghana. All the projects here are just really inspiring to hear about, for sure. I've, I'm very inspired for the, <laughs> since yesterday, and uh, actually I've known about you guys for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a question in the lead up to what we just mentioned here. You know, there are so many great ideas. There are so many eureka moments in in this world but not all of them reach the stage where your projects have have reached so what's if there is the secret recipe that led to the success of these projects i think that's what innovators really want to know you know what distinguished your project and and the work you've put in uh, versus the breadth of ideas that have ultimately you know i have plenty of ideas myself that <laughs> that I thought were great ideas and then eventually went down the drain. So yeah, would anyone care to jump in? Or maybe go first. So there's two massive, massive issues in, in global education right now. There's the lack of access and the lack of quality really for like our project. And I suspect many of the wider award winners, both this year and the last, having two, um, two components to, to an idea are pretty important. One, firstly, the impact. If you're not, if you're not creating an impact, impactful program, then what's the point? And secondly, the ability to scale. There are so many impactful programs, but they're not, they're not operating in models that have the ability to scale and be meaningfully like reduced in the education deficit, whether that be in access or quality. As you asked the question, indeed, I think impact is, is great, but I, I would say for me, it was the help work of many people, you know, like really believing in something and really being sure, like the purpose behind it and then really knowing and being focused on the benefit of others and bringing others and so many people together you no know? i don't think there is something you can do that doesn't imply the work and talent of many people 
a purpose that joins people together and a lot of hard work. <laughs> I don't think you can get out of that one. No, sir. The framing of a secret uh, recipe just puts more pressure on. But, uh, <laughs> no, it's, a, it's an interesting question. And it's also every time you reflect on this question, the response is different based on the context you're in. But if I look back, I think uh, a few things which worked for us and it, it might not work for everyone, but in general, right? Like this is the only thing I have ever done. I did this right after college, right? So the context was very, very different. I had no experience of working anywhere. Uh, my colleague Gautam, both of us started this together and uh, we, we didn't have too much work experience. So one of the things when I look back, I think we had like high amounts of curiosity. Curiosity to a point it bothered, irritated and annoyed people. And there was a certain amount of shamelessness we both had. Like we, we were okay being curious to the point of troubling others. So over the last 10 years, I've realized that curiosity like trumps criticality. It's easy to be critical, especially the kind of work we all do. I, I would like to believe we face more defeats than victories, right? Sometimes it feels like you're, you're pushing this huge stone and most part of the world is on the other side, right? Uh, you want to go and tell people the benefit of social emotional learning, but people might still say, you know, we want to improve scores. So one is this curiosity and, and the curiosity, if it comes from the right space, it unlocks a lot of things in you. So, and this is one thing I've heard a lot of people say about us, uh, about the organization of Reap Benefit. So that's one thing. The second thing I feel is, like you said, ideas are cheap. Execution is very, very tough. Uh, but the, the best thing is like walking the talk. If you are walking the talk or at least making the attempt to walk the talk, it unlocks a very different magnetic field in and around your team. People look at you, are observing you. And when you're walking the talk, it is it is a certain invisible commitment of your emotion, right? And intention is a very powerful thing. It propels a lot of things. So we, we can have plans, we can have strategies, we can have frameworks around impact, but the intention is very important. So the second part, I think what makes all these wise awardees, why they're here for 10 years, 15 years is because I think it is walking the talk, the actually executing and embodying what you're talking to people. And I think the third learning I had, um, because I was very young, a mentor told me is don't assume or don't defend. So sometimes you can get into your own bubble and you can start lying to yourself that you have a solution for the problem. The truth is nobody has a solution. But if you assume and you defend what you're doing, you're not listening to the stakeholder whom you're in service of. You feel you know more than them. So every time when we were in doubt, Gautam and me, we would say, let's just go back to the stakeholder and ask her or him, what do they really think of what we're doing? And over the years, I've seen this pattern across lots of very strong grassroots organizations. Like they don't assume, they don't defend, almost they're listening to the stakeholder. They have one ear to the ground. They're walking the talk. And the most admirable entrepreneurs for me were very, very curious, uh, very, very curious, almost like childlike curiosity. So if this somebody is listening to this and this works for you, please let me know. Then this is the magic recipe you're asking about. Yeah. <laughs> to be curious. Yeah, be curious, walk the talk and don't assume or defend. I think th this is the magic formula which has worked for us so far. All great insights being shared here and all which, you know, make components of what the awards represents as a program. It's uh, some of the uh, main elements or criteria that we try to gauge in terms of evaluating projects such as yourselves. Maybe, Neve, you can tell us a bit about the criteria that we work with. Thanks, Basim. Yes, I was actually thinking back to myself on the criteria, uh, listening to the three of you talking and thinking about how, you know, different parts of each of your projects that we were able to see throughout the due diligence stage of what it is that's not only innovative about what you bring to the field of education, but also in terms of impact, as you were mentioning, Andrew, sustainability and scalability. And it was making me think about how each of the projects that we have here today, you know, they've existed across different regions different time scales, uh, serving different beneficiaries. But I was just thinking to ask to each of you, do you feel that the story of your project has changed over time naturally? If so, what was it that maybe you feel you saw a kind of turning point in what it was that you were doing? I think the core has not changed. When we started, the core was agency of young people, ownership of their neighborhoods and solving climate and civic issues. It was very clear. The packaging around that has changed over the years and because the context has also changed. Initially, uh, we were told uh, we are building some change making skills. We were like, yeah, OK, this is change making skills. Then we had some people from John Hopkins University do, they did a research on us and they said, oh, by the way, you're building 21st century skills. When we read them, we were like, these are 19th century skills, but okay, fine, <laughs> well, let's call this 21st century skills, right? 
like like the core intent has not changed but the the articulation around that has become more mature like we have also become a little more humble to realize that sometimes people have cert- certain mental models they're operating with and it's not worth fighting that battle and trying to change that mental model as long as you're not changing the core intent right so that is one a few learnings like when we would go and talk to young people we would say you know we have to solve climate issues civic issues and things like this but what we're learning from young people was yeah all these issues are great but what about my self efficacy first so that was another form of articulation change right like uh, uh, the, the question we started asking ourselves is okay who are we doing this for are we doing this for ourselves or are we doing it for the stakeholder and the young person is saying yes these issues are important but where am i in these range of issues the i then we and then us right so how does that transition happen so that was another learning just from a stakeholder point of view then we realize okay self efficacy leads to collective efficacy that leads to system efficacy that leads to political efficacy but 7 years back i would have said the same thing i just didn't know self efficacy and collective efficacy <laughs> and so 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 these kind of small things but the core remains the same the articulation changes it's a trap sometimes because you are also mimicking what you are hearing again and again so you don't want to change the articulation too often the good news now is in india we have the national education policy which is focusing on skills for the future so suddenly after 10 years we are not feeling left out in india we are feeling okay now people understand our work but it's been almost like a decades journey uh, to almost make people open up uh, or even the word social emotional learning in india has only entered the last 3 4 5 years because of organizations like one of the wise awardees last year dream a dream they have played a huge role in opening up that ecosystem the narrative changes but the core remains the same Oh, maybe from our side, um, again, probably not much has changed in terms of the goal of the program to get more kids into better school. Um, I think one of the things that's become more apparent to us and also to funders is solving the access problem is only half of the issue, right? Um, and act- actually, if we talk about the global education deficit, um, by number of kids, there's more kids that are sitting in a class but not learning than are not in school. And so I guess the way that the program's pivoted is that about about 5 years ago now we launched an education quality program to come alongside of the finance support for school leaders and teachers and so not just about getting more capital into schools um but about it improving the quality of the schools and definitely both are, are, are still very much needed in many of the markets that we work in. I do think the core hasn't changed but the scope of the work has changed. also the maturing of what we're doing and growing into from this like very core idea of like building your own social emotional competency for well-being and then really maturing to community now so i think our focus and the whole program end and and maturation is in this part of saying we've helped with teacher self efficacy each of them feel that they're capable and able to carry their work but how do we help community keep it beyond ourselves build this autonomy build this collaboration that it be integrated into schools that can prevail when we're gone i think this humility of saying no the more you know the less you know somehow the more there's to do the more you have to learn from your stakeholders the more we have to learn to listen and to add to that actually going back to sort of the criteria we work with the awards sustainability is another component we sort of evaluate internally and i think what you're mentioning about partnerships and collaboration communities and and so forth is a very important element that guarantees the long term life of a project such as uh, the projects you're working on maybe you could tell me and the a little bit to the audience about you know what it's like to make partnerships successful in the work you're doing and how do you approach the dynamics of the relationship in general so that having mutually beneficial beneficial partnerships is the key right i guess similar to daniela like we don't want to do anything that if if our program stops operating in 5 years we want that impact to continue and so working through local partners is the most important thing that you can do and having the incentives right for all actors um so in our case that means the incentives right for the financial institutions or banks that are lending to the schools the incentives right for the schools to continue to operate and the incentives right for the parents and students to continue showing up to school and so we play this balancing act between those three key stakeholders to make sure that the interests are all aligned in terms of the the business model that we're trying to roll out I think for us it's because our partners are like our beneficiaries are children indirectly directly the educators in this case we also work in health but I haven't spoken about that and I 
I'll leave that out for this time. But those are our direct beneficiaries. But then we work with our implementation allies, which are the ministries of education. And as a nonprofit, we have to work with donors. So really learning how to work and talk and make it significant to all parties, for sure. And then working, uh, I think that respect of really listening you know, to what the needs are at the different points and the different stakeholders and getting them involved. And I think it has worked a lot because when you work and listen, you know, for the, let's say, Minister of Education, she or him, you know, so that's one work listening to what they want, their own political ideas, and it has to be in, in alignment for them. There's a but balance to strike. Right? There's yeah. a balance to strike, right? And then you're listening to the teachers and what they need and what is happening at that level. So I really think that paying attention and trying also to build those bridges of communication and make those things align. I think there's a, a slight nuance of partnership and partnering. And I think Daniela actually really spoke uh, about that partnership is a state you want to be in. You're sitting in a room imagining how your love life should be. Partnering is the act of falling in love and, you know, being at it. And partnering is a very human exercise. Uh, you're working with humans, real humans, and uh, there are so many stages and states uh, the partners are in. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, it gets very difficult. Uh, therefore, we can talk about collaboration, but collaborating is a way more difficult muscle to build. Uh, what we have learned is a few things around collaboration is that and there are different stakeholders you have. You have the government stakeholders where there is already a power structure created. Uh, then you have civil society uh, collaborations in, in that you have two types of civil society organizations. Organizations which are smaller than you. Uh, so where you, uh, in, the, in the power balance, you are higher up at the power structure. And then you have civil society organizations who are bigger than you. They are higher up in the power structure, right? Uh, and, and finally... Uh, the stakeholders you're working with, they are also a partner uh, you're working with. And what we have learned is um, three things around uh, how to probably effectively partner. Uh, one is, at least in some types of partnering, the partnering does not work very well top down. So the founders can meet and shake their hands and say, you know, we want to partner. Uh, but the real magic is when people on the ground are coming together. Uh, that's where the real magic will happen and therefore building a team which knows uh, how to partner is very very important or else generally what happens is the founders the ceo the leadership teams decides on partnering and then we expect the team on the field uh, to actually partner and I've, we have seen that there's a huge disconnect there because the realities are very different uh, the second thing what we have realized is to be open to where the partner is sometimes when we enter into a partnership we have a certain rigid view of course, there should be a value alignment, but I think openness and flexibility to understand where the partner is and kind of navigate around it. And the third learning we have got is like, you have different types of partnerships. Certain partnerships are emotional in nature, right? Just driven by a certain value. Certain partnerships are just driven by a certain form of learning. So we call it learning partnerships. And certain type of partnerships around like are around finance uh, or incentives. And knowing what type of partnership you want to do when is also very, very, uh, very, very important. So this has been our learning. So we have failed in a lot of partnerships uh, to arrive at uh, this kind of uh, learning. But like I said, the act of partnering is way more difficult than the thought of partnering. And uh, these are the three things we have figured out. If, if you can more or less do this, your failure rate kind of decreases. You will still fail in partnering but it's at least more thought through. That's what we have learned. Fail forward, as uh, yeah. another yes. award winner yes. said yes. in our last conversation. Yeah. No, all very interesting and uh, insightful uh, conversations we're having here. You know, I think we could eventually wrap this up, maybe a final question. But before I jump to that, maybe, Neve, do you want to jump in with any any reflections or, or questions from your end? Yeah, Kuldeep, just what you were sharing on, you know, the magic happening on the ground I'd just like to ask for those that are listening, how do you capture that magic, you know, in terms of the impact and what it is for that each of you are doing? Yeah, it's like, like I said, right, if I use a metaphor of love, how do you capture the magic of love uh, on the ground? Uh, there's no, no, but um, I, I think a couple of things, uh, some uh, proxy indicators, uh, one for us, the indicator is how many partnerships are happening. That's a very big indicator. So, you know, that you have a team which really values partnering uh, because people who are on the field sometimes 
and i'm i've been a field worker grassroots worker myself uh, when you get two two very competent teachers while you're deeply listening but somewhere you also feel that your pedagogical style is better than the other person there is that right so i think one good proxy indicator could be how many partnerships are happening apart from the leadership team then you're you're exhibiting collaboration in action you know rather by talking about so that's one proxy indicator the second thing in our case is uh, we have a bias to action in reap benefit and the reason why we have bias to action is because we feel uh, like what she said at the start there is more to learning and exhibiting learning apart from the cerebral part of it now when you're a young person coming from a underserved community in, in any part of the world you're carrying a lot of intergenerational trauma you don't have support systems and things like that but action becomes a very very good democratic unit you know uh, irrespective of the background i'm coming from if i'm taking an action in my community it is in a way the closest democratic unit you can have it's almost like a sport right once you're on the field it does not necessarily matter what background you're coming from so for us the second indicator is are we able to show actions on the ground which means that a young person is willing to break inertia the young person is willing to go out in the community the young person is willing to actually stake a claim in the community and then the young person is willing to report back that i've staked claim in the community so that becomes a second indicator that you know some magic is happening and the third is as soon as that happens are there enough is there enough energy in the ecosystem to get them into communities together and are they willing to talk so we, if these three things happen you know you're in the, you're in the right direction because once the communities get started then that's a new loop of building sustaining managing weaving and orchestrating these communities but then you know that these things have happened but in our ecosystem if action is not happening and only pontification is happening we're like yeah this is good this is intellectual this is very nice we can write a paper on this and write an article all that is great and there's value to that but action is the democratic unit right that is showing skin in the game and for a skin in the game is a very very important part if there is no skin in the game uh then yeah it's it's nice it's cute but nothing beyond that so these are some indicators so is our partner showing skin in the game that's also very very important for us if the partner is not showing skin in the game yeah then it's 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 sweet but nothing beyond that just talking in how we see people say nor teacher say that this came like in the right time in my life it really changed my life my relationship my family really this is one i mean seeing or hearing what's happening in the classrooms with the children the capacities they're building their self awareness those stories no that are just so so rich in what you can actually see in the transformation and one that's the big jewel for me is this that i was saying like for example the indigenous maya speaking teachers no it's like hearing being there and, and them telling us like atentamente has heard us nobody hears us and you've heard us and and through that being heard they came up you know with their own like narrative they made their own stories that we helped them produce into little videos but it was there no it's in maya it's talking about social emotional learning and so it, by being heard then they can do their own you know and work on their own so i think that the magic for in that way is is this dimension of seeing the impact directly in the beneficiaries and then seeing things that are bigger you know which are like seeing how it's a whole district it's a whole state it's not like they're already and we're saying should we be able to get to 100% of the schools in this group and somebody saying 100% but i have more schools than here i want to go further <laughs> you know and people just wanting to take it up and i think one more thing that i would want to say that i think it's part of this magic of of collaboration and alliances is when when people listen to you when you have enough not to to say and if enough experience that you can go to a minister in our case right the minister of education and say we want to work with you in the state and and they'll take you seriously because they, your work has walked the talk you know for them and for other and they know you're there for what you do because it takes a lot for people to trust you you know because why why would we trust these guys what do they want you know and uh, so i think that is also the part of the magic you know that you walk the talk you know that people can actually trust you No especially when you're working in I feel like education I mean where things are typically traditional and rigid and not so change agile I would say I'd imagine walking the talk is is absolutely critical you both have uh, echoed towards each other I'm going to ask two final questions not one if you could tell yourself something 5 10 years ago as a young innovator budding entrepreneur 
what would that key lesson be? Mine's short. It's find something that works and scale it. Keep on working, keep on perfecting. No, like don't stop, you know, like you found it or you think it works, but keep on going. No, there's more depth. Called, trust no? the like, process. Trust yeah. the process and keep on going. And don't get frustrated by it, I guess. No, like, like that's part of it. So just find something, do it well, do it deeply, keep on learning. Uh, if I had to go back and talk to myself, uh, one I would say is trust the process. Even if you have not found something, uh, there is so much value to the process itself that magic happens, doors open. So uh, don't take yourself too seriously. Like, I mean, you're not the savior of the world, uh, right? <laughs> like, don't take it too seriously. And like truly find joy in this work. I, at least I can go back and I had this certain imagery of an entrepreneur, you know, serious and uh, like uh, grumpy and uh, uh, and then things like that. I, I probably read a lot of um, biographies of American entrepreneurs and I was like, you know, this is the only way to, you know, operate. Uh, but if I could go back, I would say truly trust the process. Uh, you know, like, like entrepreneurship is in a way uh, like building a forest. You can't plan how the forest grows. You just leave the seeds and allow for the ecosystem to take over. So one would be trust the process. Second, don't take yourself too seriously. Don't think, don't come with this savior complex that you're changing the world. You're here because deep down you're doing it for yourself. And I think that's something I would tell every young person, like don't give yourself that much importance. And third is just find joy. Like uh, there's so much uh, power to uh, joy and don't be grumpy all the time. So, I'm still grumpy. That's a problem. I'm still, I'm still work in progress. If my team members hear this podcast, they would probably extract this part. And in every meeting they would say, oh, somebody said be joyous and don't be grumpy. But uh, uh, this is something I'm not walking the talk. <laughs> yeah, it's a work in progress. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can wrap this up with the final question really is that, you know, I'd like to go back to what I said in the beginning and, and say it again. Congratulations, truly. You've all accomplished really incredible work. What's next? Yes, so globally, there's 630 million kids that are either out of school or in school and not learning. Like, I think we as a community have a responsibility to be chipping away at that as quickly as we can to improve both access and quality. The Education Finance Program at Opportunity International has been operating now for 15 years, and through that about 36,000 schools have been financed. So we've got to 11 million kids, which is great. At 11 million out of 630 million, like we've got a long way to go as an industry, right? And so yes, we can push as hard to scale as quickly as we can, but we need other actors in here doing, a lot, uh, doing good work to improve access and quality of education. And so there's effectively two pieces of work we have. One, to scale what we know is working as quickly and as efficiently as we can. But secondly, to bring others along on the journey. And I think, you know, WISE does a really good job of that. Yeah, I think for us, we're at that point too. I mean, like that scaling, no, that really, because we want the systemic change, no? So we need something that can be strong enough and last enough to see changes that are more durable. So I think that... That scaling for me is like this idea, okay, if you have a statewide intervention, you know, all teachers and, and you can actually be there for a couple of years consistently to build that capacity. And then we need, you know, that's where we want to go, you not know, to build that capacity systemically at scale. So we can just be happy to, to let other people do it all <laughs> and not be the center of the world, which we never were, but yes. Yeah, quite uh, similar. Uh, this year, officially, we are 10th year. I think the first thing is learning how to celebrate. That in itself is difficult. So that's very high on the agenda this year. Uh, I, I've been very deeply reflecting what scaling actually means for the longest time. Um, and and I mean, there's no right definition to what scale is. I think in our case, uh, we have been asking ourselves, how do we scale the idea uh, and not necessarily the organization? Uh, you know, how can I... And, uh, I've been reading a lot of research around movement building. Research uh, by this professor at uh, Harvard, Erika Chenworth, wherein she talks about what she calls as the 3.5% rule. If you can create a movement with 3.5% of the population you're working with, it becomes an irreversible movement and then it becomes a social change. So I've been obsessed with this 3.5% rule, you know, what is the tipping point and how we can reach. So there are two pathways uh, we have decided. One, sorry, three pathways. One is the horizontal, like how can we use technology to uh, amplify our work smarter and better. Clearly, I have learned in during COVID that technology is not the silver bullet, but it is a great amplifier. Then, so the two pathways using technology is one, how do we make thousand flowers bloom? Uh, how can reap benefit become redundant? So how can there be more communities of young people self-mobilizing? 
uh, and using technology and moving forward irrespective of re-benefit itself. So that's one pathway we are taking. And the other pathway is um, it's an interesting time to be in, in India. How do we intervene systematically with governments so that, you know, we are leaving a more long lasting intervention uh, in a system and we being aware that it might not be the way we were imagining it so one is uh, we'll have no control working with the government but uh, at least it's a part of a system and while the system moves slowly we are somewhere there in the system the other one is completely outside the system we're in using technology how can we have thousands and thousands of self-mobilized communities through different parts of India, wherein young people are just doing it by themselves. So even if the government intervention doesn't work, you already have these communities operating, all interconnected through technology. So three things, celebrating the 10th year, using technology to grow and uh, intervening in the government. And it's good we always come to you towards the end because you have a way of wrapping oh, is it? all the insights uh, together. Oh. So <laughs> No, thank you. Thank you all so much. It's been a wonderful conversation and really, truly, congratulations. And thank you for joining me on Wise On Air. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for having us. And that's a wrap. We hope you enjoyed this episode and gained valuable insights from these Wise Awards winning innovators. Now, these projects you heard about today were all recognized by the Wise Awards for their outstanding contributions to education. Each year, the Wise Awards recognizes six projects for their innovation, impact, sustainability, and scalability. So if you know of such a project or are working on one, be sure to consider applying or nominating in the next call for application opening later this year. More information can be found in the description. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and colleagues and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps out a lot. If you have any feedback or suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach out to us anytime on our social media platforms. All the links are in the description. Finally, don't forget to subscribe to Wise On Air wherever you get your podcasts to be notified of our upcoming episodes. We'll be back soon with an episode detailing the journey of Qatar's first edtech testbed and key lessons we can derive for other edtech initiatives in the space. Until then, keep on learning and thank you so much for tuning in to Wise On Air.